Hello again. Today I will walk you through the process of deriving classical physics from scratch, walking in Newton and Galileo's uh, shoes. I feel like despite it being easy, classical physics actually encompasses some formulas that students have no idea about where they came from or why they are the way they are. So, starting with the easy ones and working our way upwards, I want to motivate and prove some of the most important equations a student usually encounters in high school. Well, let's spend a brief moment setting the stage. The velocity will be defined as the rate of change of, of the distance with, with respect to time, or otherwise said, the derivative of position with respect to time. I leave the calculus versions on the side when they're unnecessary or trivial enough. Well, we define the acceleration the same way to be the rate of change of velocity with respect to time. Delta velocity will be the velocity at some time, t2, minus the velocity at the previous time, t1, or v2 minus v1. And so, v2 minus v1 over delta t will be equal to a, and so v2 will be equal to a times delta t plus v1. This is trivial enough, but we are gonna use it later. If the acceleration is not constant, we, def we can say that v2 is equal to the integral over time, the integral of acceleration over time, plus the initial speed v1. I'll use the concept of average velocity two times here to derive our next two formulas. Well, the average velocity is v1 plus v2 over 2, and using our previous result for v2, we see that the average velocity is a times delta t plus v1 plus v1 over 2, and using the cons and using the formula that says that the average velocity times the delta time is equal to the total distance, we can say uh, by expanding uh, the numerator on the previous fraction that the distance is equal to v1 delta t plus a delta t squared over 2. We do the same thing over here. And by noticing that delta t is equal to v2 minus v1 over the acceleration when acceleration is constant, we can say that the distance will be equal to the average velocity, which is v2 plus v1 over 2, times delta t, which is v2 minus v1 over a, and so v squared, uh, v2 squared, squared minus v1 squared will be equal to 2 times a times t. Well, now we want to quantify the motion of a body, specifically something we call the amount of motion, or momentum. The momentum is equal to the mass times the speed, or the velocity of this body. We can write this as the mass times the derivative of the position with respect to time. And we, notice that, or we say that a force is what changes the momentum of a body. Otherwise, a force is how much, or how much do it change the amount of motion uh, of a body in a certain amount of time? Or that the derivative of the momentum with respect to time is equal to the force. Now we can notice that uh, the mass is constant in classical physics with respect to time, so uh, the derivative of m times dx dt will be equal to m times the second derivative of x dt, which is mass times ac acceleration. And so delta momentum will be the force times delta time, in the case where the force is constant with respect to time, or in the case where force is some function of time with, that is not constant, we, they, we say that the delta of the momentum is the integral from t1 to t2 of f of t dt. Well, now we come to the formula of uh, the force of gravity, or the gravitational force between two bodies. Well, it is intuitive enough to say that the force of attraction between in two bodies is going to be proportional to the product of their masses. Otherwise, said, the force of gravity is uh, some constant k times the mass of the first body times the mass of the second body. Well, let's draw some diagram to know what else does this force depend upon. We've got our planet Earth and some three-dimensional sphere around it. We know that the surface of this sphere 
is 4 pi r squared. If you're interested in where this formula came from or how to derive similar formulas for spheres in higher dimensions, make sure to check my channel. I've already posted a video talking about this. Well, if you imagine gravity as being some forces, some force communicated by particles that we call gravitons in quantum mechanics, they're not, they haven't been proven yet, but um, we're just thinking of them this way to, to explain uh, what we're going to get at. Then the density of this particle, of the amount, the density of the amount of these particles, uh, will vary inversely as the square of the distance between them and the center of the sphere. So we can see that the force of gravity, which will depend upon these particles, for example, uh, will be equal to some constant k over the square of the distance. Now, in classical physics, these particles do not, these particles do not exist, do not exist at all. They just or some way for us to think about why uh, gravity will vary in inversely as the square of the distance. Well, putting these two together, we can see that the attractive or gravitational force between two bodies is some constant g times the uh, product of their masses over the square of the distance between them, or between their centers. And so the gravitational force of the Earth is equal to that constant g times the mass of the Earth times uh, the mass of the body that is being attracted to the Earth over the square of the distance, which is just the radius of the planet Earth. And since the uh, gravitational force of the Earth on some body is the mass of that body times uh, the uh, gravitational acceleration, uh, small g, that means that m times small g is equal to big G times big M times small m over d squared. Or we can say that g, the gravitational acceleration, is equal to big G times big M over the square of the radius. And if you Google these uh, three terms and uh, divide them uh, the way they are here, you're indeed gonna find that the gravitational constant, the gravitational um, acceleration of the Earth, the g, is approximately equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. Well, now we're going to talk about um, centripetal uh, acceleration and centripetal force. We have got our planet Earth with its center and its diameter, and we've got some body that will move uh, in line tangent to uh, the surface of the planet. Here I've exaggerated um, portions, they're meant to actually be infinitesimal distances, but uh, for us to be able to see them, I exaggerated them a lot. <laughs> well, it's gonna move in some distance and then the acceleration or the force of gravity of the Earth will bring it down. That distance it moves, if it moves at a certain speed v, uh, will be equal to v times delta t, or in the infinitesimal case, dt. And since we know that the distance is v1 times delta t plus the acceleration times delta t squared over 2, and here the perpendicular or the normal component of the acceleration uh, has no initial v, and so we can say that v1 is equal to 0, we get that uh, the the distance in the direction of the accelerator uh, of the acceleration will be one half the acceleration times delta times squared. Well, let's do some bit of the geometry here. We are going to name this angle theta, and so this angle, which is the inscribed angle, will be theta over two, and this angle, the tangential angle, will also be theta over two. Uh, this will be equal to v times dt, and we can notice here that uh, this angle also will be perpendicular, so uh, we have two similar triangles. The, uh, tri the triangle whose so side or whose base is equal to 2 times the radius of the Earth minus a half a dt squared, and has another side v dt, will be similar to the triangle which has a base v dt, and the opposite side, uh, one half uh, acceleration times dt squared. Since they both have an angle theta over 2 and a 90 degrees angle, 
and uh, their other angles will also be the same. So by similarity rules, we find that one half a dt squared over v dt must be equal to v dt over 2r minus a half a dt squared. But in the case where dt is infinitesimal, the minus a half dt squared won't matter. So expanding these out and solving and removing the tts, we find out that the square of the velocity will be equal to the centripetal acceleration times r, otherwise said, the centripetal acceleration of uh, exerted on somebody is the square of its velocity if it's on the same orbit over the radius of that orbit. And since f is equal to m times a, the centripetal force is m times the square of velocity over the radius. Since we know that uh, the definition of an angle theta in radians is the arc length over the radius, and since uh, in the infinitesimal version the body is moving on the perimeter or on the circumference of uh, that circle, we can say that the derivative of theta uh, with respect to time is the derivative of L over R with respect to time, which is just 1 over R times the derivative of the arc length with respect to time. Uh, not actually the arc length, the derivative of the arc length traveled with respect to time, which is just the speed of that body with, uh, with the speed of that body. So, in our formula, we replace uh, V over R by the derivative of theta with respect to R, which we call... Um, uh, angular velocity, so we get that the centripetal force is equal to m times r times the angular velocity squared or m times r times omega squared and do not confuse this omega with um, the letter w which, uh, which indicates work or energy that we're going to encounter in just a moment. Well, Work is defined as the force applied on some body times the displacement displacement of that body in the direction of the force. Or otherwise said, the integral from position 1 up to position 2 of the force times uh, t of the position. So the potential energy will be the integral from r to r plus h, r being the radius of the planet Earth and h being the height that somebody uh, is on after some uh, energy being applied on it uh, to get to a higher uh, position uh, in the Earth's gravitational field. Uh, the force here is negative g times m times small m over the square of the position. I've put the negative sign because here the uh, uh, the f gravitational force is in the opposite direction of uh, displacement. That simplifies to the gravitational constant times the mass of the Earth times the mass of the body times the integral from r to r plus h of negative 1 over x squared dx. This is equal to uh, gravitational constant times the mass of the Earth times the mass of the body times negative 1 over r plus h plus 1 over r. And this is equal to gm over r plus h squared times m times h. Uh, this is in the case where h is big enough so that the acceleration is not constant, when h is small enough so that we can consider acceleration to be constant. This simplifies to saying that the potential energy is equal to m times g times h. Now let's derive the formula for the kinetic energy of a body which feels like it's probably the most unmotivated formula in classical mechanics. I'll prove it in two ways, a rather basic way and another more insightful way that will help you deepen your understanding. Now, starting with the basic easy one. We're gonna use uh, the definition of the force and the definition of work to find this formula. Since F is equal to MA and the acceleration is equal to V over T, assuming the body starts its motion from rest at time zero, then, t is equal to v over a, and so the distance is, which is 1 half a times t squared will be 1 half a times v over a squared, 
which boils down to d is equal to v squared over 2a using the definition of work this is equal to form uh, to force times distance which is ma times v squared over 2a and so the kinetic energy which is equal to the work done here is one half mass times velocity squared now the more insightful well i'm going to assume we um, threw some ball uh, in the upward direction such that uh, this is it, the path it took and i'm going to use the conservation of energy here which says that uh, the con specifically the conservation of uh, mechanical energy which uh, says that the potential energy plus the kinetic energy of somebody will be constant uh, assuming there is no friction or uh, irresistance or plastic def deformation or anything that actually sucks the energy out of uh, that system well at the bottom the kinetic energy is c and the potential energy energy is zero with some speed that we'll call v at the top the potential energy is c the uh, speed will be zero and the kinetic energy uh, will be zero now the height that this ball reaches will be equal to the velocity it started out uh, with times the time it took to reach uh, the uh, highest point minus a half g times t squared g t being the uh, gravitational acceleration and the minus sign is because the acceleration is in the opposite side of movement well uh, moving the half g t squared to the other side and dividing by t we get that v is equal to h over t plus a half g t Squaring both sides, we get v squared is equal to h squared over t squared plus one fourth g squared t squared plus gh. And since time is equal to v over g, or, or otherwise said, time is equal to the velocity over acceleration, we get that v squared is equal to h squared g squared over v squared. We just here replaced time by uh, v over g plus one fourth v squared. Here we again replace time by v over g plus gh. And by the formula we proved in the beginning of the video, 2gh is equal to v squared minus v1 squared. v here is being the velocity at the bottom, and v1 is the velocity at the top, which is actually 0. We get that 2gh is equal to v squared, or g squared h squared is equal to v to the fourth over 4. Substituting that into our formula, we get that v squared is equal to v to the fourth over 4 v squared plus 1 fourth v squared plus gh, or v squared is equal to 1 fourth v squared plus 1 fourth v squared plus gh, or that 1 half v squared is equal to gh, multiplying both sides by m, we get that 1 half mv squared is equal to mgh, which is the potential energy at the top. So what at the bottom is equal to the potential energy at the top? Of course, that is the kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy is equal to one half the mass times the square of the velocity. And that's how we use the, the concept of conservation of uh, energy to uh, derive the formula for kinetic energy using just the formula for, um, uh, for uh, the potential energy. If you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. And until next video, uh, go physimatize the world.